good evening and welcome to our Community for Care program. My name is Cheryl Cook. I'm the chairperson of Simsbury's Community for Care. Um, tonight we are very pleased to present this program to you on the dangers of vaping. As you can see, we have a live demo here. Um, I'd like to especially thank our panelists, um, Officer Todd Cushman, School Resource Officer, Officer Jeremy, Jeremy Cormier, also our School Resource Officer, and Jennifer Curtanis, who is the Director of the Farmington Valley Health District. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I always get invited here to talk about really tough topics. Uh, we were here a couple months ago talking about the opioid epidemic and tonight we've been asked to touch um, base on some of the information that we have about vaping, which in my opinion is really a growing public health concern, particularly among our young kids, um, high schoolers, middle schoolers, etc. Um, as you can see, there are some uh, examples, so you'll have an opportunity to kind of touch and get a feel for what um, we're talking about tonight. But really, we're talking about electronic nicotine delivery systems, um, vaping, e-cigarettes, e-hookahs, all of these um, little devices are used to take a liquid and vaporize it for purposes of inhaling. Initially, what are called ENDS, or electronic nicotine delivery systems, were developed in large part as a smoking cessation tool. However, while there's anecdotal evidence from individuals who were cigarette smokers that now use electronic nicotine delivery systems or vapes to get their nicotine, that they feel better, there really has been no good evidence that these are effective smoking cessation tools. So, um, and unfortunately, they've evolved and developed without a lot of regulation. So you'll be hearing me talk a little bit about that. So what do we know about the use of um, vaping devices among our youth? Well, 5.7%, and this data comes from 2015, so it's old, 5.7% of our high school students who never tried, who have never tried vaping said that they were likely to try it in the near future. And upwards of 25% of all of our middle school and high school kids have reported vaping or trying to vape. And we, we expect that this is significantly higher in 2018 because the num numbers actually doubled from 2011 to 2013. The proportion of kids that were using vaping devices doubled. So in all likelihood, and I'm sure the kids in the room can speak to this. The young adults in the room can speak to this. It's probably much higher than this 25% that we see up here now. Um, what is really disconcerting about this is that in we were seeing a decrease in the use of cigarettes, cigars, biddies, any other form of tobacco product prior to 2015. And now with the e-cigarettes, we're actually seeing an increase in their use among this population. So why is this, um, I'll talk a little bit about what we see. So here you have 25% of high school students reporting that they've ever vaped. It's more common, slightly more common among males than females, although not by much. And we're seeing it more common in non-Hispanic whites than we are any other racial or ethnic group. What is also interesting in this data is that the gray bars represent the middle schoolers and the gold bars represent high school. So you're seeing a significant increase. And this is typical of lots of other experimental things that kids do. Um, we see a really big jump from the ninth grade to the 10th grade. There's all sorts of theories behind that peer pressure, exposure, et cetera, but there's a real opportunity from a prevention standpoint to get at these kids younger. It's never too late to talk about the hazards and the issues associated with these products, hopefully to stem that tide as they move on into high school. So 
why is it that we're seeing an increased use in e-cigarettes uh, among our high school kids? Um, one of the biggest influences on this is the perception that e-cigarettes are not harmful, that they don't affect your health. And while there is still a lot of information that we don't know about long-term effects of vaping or e-cigarettes, increasingly we are recognizing and seeing data and studies that talk about the health effects, um, and this is just not true, and we'll talk a little bit about those health effects in more um, detail. Um, one, there's flavor. So in the past, um, you know, for folks that didn't like the smell of cigarette or didn't like the way that cigarettes felt when you inhaled, et cetera, um, the flavors and um, advertising and things are really attracting and appealing to youth. Um, it's not as irritating, et cetera. Um, youth are really into high tech. This is a high tech tool, um, so it's sort of appealing in that regard. Of course, with any type of experimental process, it's the curiosity. Well, my friends are doing it, let me try. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about how manufacturers are using advertising just like they did with cigarettes to really glamorize the e-cigarettes and their use. Um, cigarettes are extremely expensive right now and you can go online and buy a vaping starter product from anywhere from $25 to $30. Um, and that's a product that will last. You just have to buy the refills. Um, so it costs a lot less. Um, we had made great, in part, some of the downturn in the use of cigarette smoking among our youth is because of the very high cigarette tax and the costs associated with buying a pack of cigarettes. So um, costs less, so it's not within, it's not out of reach for our youth to purchase. Um, and uh, I think the officers can probably speak to this. It's very easy to hide. Uh, your clothes don't smell of cigarette smoke. Um, you can do it pretty discreetly in public places, et cetera. So another reason why this might be attractive to youth. So are electronic nicotine devices safer? Um, in the next slide, I'll go into a little bit more detail of the effects of vaping, but just from a public health standpoint, I think this is a growing and a next, the next public health crisis really for our youth. One, it's renormalizing smoking. So what we're seeing actually is in youth that have started with vaping, they're far more likely to then go back to a cigarette-based product, which at least now all indications are, are, are that it's still more hazardous to smoke a cigarette, even though vaping still has its health concerns. So while we were seeing real reductions in the use of traditional tobacco products, we're likely to see an upswing in that again. Um, and it's increased intention to smoke cigarettes, so or increasing the intention to. So um, it is, you know, I think for the kids in the room, they probably are all familiar with the term gateway, gateway drugs. E-cigarettes are the gateway drug to cigarette, traditional cigarettes. So um, the, one of the most um, detrimental aspects, there's both, you know, kind of acute, types of health effects associated with vaping as well as longer term potential chronic health effects. Um, one of the reasons why people vape is because nicotine is a drug. Um, initially it is a stimulant, so it makes you feel a little jazzed, it makes your heart rate go up, et cetera, but it's unique in that at higher concentrations, nicotine then becomes a relaxant. So, um, you know, people like nicotine because it relaxes them, but either way, it is addictive. And so um, that in and of itself is an adverse effect, becoming addicted to a drug, this one happens to be nicotine, that will require your commitment to that drug um, in one form or another 
for a long period of time unless you break that addiction. Um, and you may actually transition when you use nicotine as a drug for a long period of time and you don't get the sit feel you're not getting the same benefits from it whether it's that initial jazz and what have you or that relaxation you may transition to something else um the e-liquid that you'll be able to kind of see close up that contains the nicotine also contains lots of other chemicals and products and right now there's really no regulation of what is in that liquid um, you can buy liquid that can contain upwards of 28 milligrams of nicotine um, again that is equivalent to the amount of nicotine in a complete pack of cigarettes, so very high levels. So it can actually result in some, you know, we have nicotine, um, you know, you're getting exposed to more nicotine in a short period of time. And the younger you are when you try it, you run the increased risk of addiction getting addicted faster because of the developing brain, smaller body, et cetera. Um, the other chemicals like propylene glycol, glycerin, food additives, et cetera, in and of themselves when vaporized, uh, break down into components. In fact, there was a study just released that looked at the urine of youth on average 16 years of age and I de they identified at least five carcinogenic chemicals in the urine of these kids that vaped. So we know that there's carcinogenic substances. While we don't know what the dose response is, we don't know how much vaping over what period of time will increase the risk of certain types of cancer, certainly purposefully using a product that is exposing you to these things is detrimental to your health. Um, the aerosol also generates very fine particulate matter. And the finer the particulate matter, the deeper into the lung it can go. Really, um, after periods of time, fine particulate matter really begins to break down um, you know, your lung tissue at the very you know, small level. And so this can result in long-term lung health consequences. Um, I talked about the fact that, you know, they actually identified in the, in the bodies of individuals that vape these carcinogenic substances. So there's really no question about whether there is exposure to that. Um, so, you know, Things like irritation, cough, increased airway resistance are all attributed to the inhalation of that vapor. The nicotine in and of itself at high levels can cause chest pain, increased blood pressure, et cetera. And then some people just react very negatively to nicotine initially, and it may cause stomach-related issues as well. So there's both short-term and long-term health implications associated with this. The long-term we're still learning about. So media and marketing, I, you know, I raised two boys of my own and I, I struggled with what are the messages that are going to resonate with young kids today about, you know, avoiding these types of substances. I mean, there's the peer pressure, et cetera. Well, one of the things that I, I think is, kids are really smart and they don't like to be taken advantage of. And the one thing that I want to emphasize with the kids in the room is the marketers of these products are taking advantage of you. They are appealing to your weaknesses. They're appealing to the things that resonate with you, that you're attracted to, to sell you a product that's going to cost you a lot of money, is probably going to cost you poor health in the long run, in the interest of them making a lot of money. And we know this because of the cigarette, you know, marketing and manufacturing of long ago. They're using the same tactics today. And social media only magnifies it. So they're marketing 
kids love celebrity endorsements. If celebrities say it's a good thing, we, you know, we have young kids that try and emulate our celebrities. So they're using celebrities to sell these products. Sports and music endorsements. You see the advertising for these things in sporting events, music events, etc. They're glamorizing it. Whether you're a male or a female, they're glamorizing it. Um, you know, the rugged guy that's you know, vaping or the glamorous woman that's vaping, and then the body image stuff. If you vape, it helps keep your weight down, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the tactics that they're using um, and unfortunately are, I think, contributing to kids' perception that this is an okay thing, um, you know, everybody does it, it's safe, I want to be like that, it's cool, et cetera. Um, they're also appealing to a person's sense of, you know, uh, self-determination. Hey, it's your life. Do what you want. Well, tell someone who has lung disease that after, you know, many years. Um, so they really try and downplay the health effects. Um, for the young kids using things like cartoons. And then the flavoring is really something that is making this extremely appealing. Um, you know, when they market, you know, apple flavor, cherry flavor, people think that's somewhat benign, um, but it's really not. So I think you'll hear more about this from the officers, but um, right now, Purchasing uh, electronic cigarette if you're under the age of 18 is prohibited. Well, Google vape on uh, the internet. It'll ask you, there'll be a click box and it'll say, are you 18 years of age? And you click yes, whether you're 13, 14, 16, or 17, and it gets you in. And you can purchase these things. And if you think kids aren't establishing PO boxes at the post office to have these things delivered, you're crazy. They're doing it. Uh, they're figuring out ways and they're purchasing this stuff online. Um, one of the things that the youth in the audience might not know is that possession, actual possession of this under the age of 18 is prohibited and there's actually fines attached. Your first offense, I think you can be charged 50 bucks. Um, it is prohibited as is smoking in our state buildings, healthcare facilities, retail food stores, school buildings, et cetera. So the use is prohibited, but it's so much easier to hide. You know, when, when I was growing up, if someone went in the girl's room and smoked a cigarette, you could smell it, you knew. Um, it's, it's very easy to hide in these places. Um, you will or you do need a retail license or permit to sell the products in Connecticut now, but the laws on this stuff are just catching up with the product. So it's not been until this year that the FDA will actually require warning statements like we have on cigarette packages on vaping products. Up until 2000, this year, there was no such warning labels. Um, and there up until next year are no requirements for manufacturers to really submit information about the harmful components of that product. So right now, you often don't even really know what else is in that liquid. Um, and the other thing that I will mention, but I'm not going into a lot of detail, is um, vaping can also be used to um, vape THC, which is the active ingredient in marijuana, again, uh, less likely to be detected if used, et cetera, in a vaping device. So um, I just want to spend a few minutes on, you know, I wouldn't be the health director if I didn't talk about prevention. And, you know, we struggle with these issues with our youth. We have forever. Um, and I don't have, you know, the magic bullet. I wish I did. Um, but we have to continue to encourage tobacco-free lifestyles as the norm. Um, and I think we made great progress in that when we passed the clean indoor air laws and youth were less exposed to smoking in public places. They didn't see adults smoking in public places, um, et cetera. Um, 
you know, how, what is that next, what is that next step that we can do uh, to really, again, make that lifestyle norm, the smoke-free norm is, you know, still not clear to me, but we need to continue to move in the, that area. Um, we need to reduce the pro-tobacco influences. Right now, vaping, advertising, et cetera, is everywhere. It's prolific in the social media, where, which is where kids are going. Um, it's much harder to see tobacco-related and cigarette-related ads. So we need to get to a point where it's a lot less easy for um, kids to see the tobacco related or the e-cigarette related marketing in our media, et cetera, et cetera. Um, including vaping in every tobacco or smoke-free policy, and I think we're making great strides in that arena. Um, making sure that our outdoor spaces are not only tobacco free but vaping free so when you go to a recreational facility a sporting event you know salmon brook park or you know the parks here that um you know kids aren't seeing people vaping all the time um Increasing the age of purchase. There is a proposed bill right now in the legislature to increase the age of purchase of all tobacco products to 21. There are some communities around the country that have done that. Um, and that does, you know, the older you put off experimenting or trying these things, the less likely you are to do them. So any of the restrictions that we can place that really, you know, work to prohibit access for younger ages is important. Um, and then limit point of sale advertising access and placement. Um, you know, I remember when I grew up, when you went to the checkout, now there's the, you know, nuts and healthy choices. Well, it was self-select, you know, a whole row of cigarettes. Well, you don't see that anymore. I don't even, you, you know, you don't even have self you know, self-purchase, you have to ask and get your carton of cigarettes or your pack of cigarettes. We have to do the same thing with vaping in some of these retail shops. Out of sight, out of mind, not easy to access. Okay, with that, I'll hand it over to you guys and then we can take questions and have some discussion. Thank you. Uh, I'm Todd Cushman, I'm the school resource officer at Henry James Middle School and the elementary schools. Um, our part of, part of this presentation will be basically to kind of obviously show you what we're seeing, what we're finding. Uh, we left the scientific stuff up to her. Uh, that's not our role, so, but we'll show you and kind of give you what to look for, what we're seeing in town here, uh, what our kids are involved in, so that, that's kind of more our side of the presentation. I'm Officer Cormier, I'm the school resource officer over at the high school. Uh, most of the stuff that you see on the table here is found on high school students, whether it was on motor vehicle stops or actually the majority of it, it was found on students inside the school. Um, so in a few minutes we'll go through all these items, but I uh, just want to touch base on one thing. Um, the tobacco and the cigarette industry is doing a really good job on grabbing these kids. And when I go into classes and I teach the classes, I try to explain to them about when I was growing up in high school, we didn't have any of this stuff. It was all cigarettes, cigars, chewing tobacco, right? The old school way of doing things. And you would know when a kid went to the bathroom and smoked a cigarette, because when he came back to class, he'd reek, right? Or you'd walk into the bathroom and you know, oh man, somebody was just in here smoking a cigarette. But those days are over. And those days have been over for a while. The cigarette and tobacco industry has done a good job because they were losing money. People were not smoking cigarettes that much anymore, cigars, using chewing tobacco. So they were losing money because the connotation of using tobacco products was bad because of the cancer that was found 20, 30 years down the road. Now, some of you guys in here might remember, most of us won't, but in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, doctors were promoting cigarettes they had big posters saying, I smoke camel, right? I choose camel because it's a soothing uh, smoke, right? 20 years later, doctors weren't promoting it anymore because cancer. 
cancer was being found in people that were smoking cigarettes. People stopped smoking cigarettes. You would go to restaurants, well, at least when I was growing up and when Officer Cushman was growing up, you would go to restaurants where they'd have smoking areas in the restaurants. Those are gone now, right? So smoking in general was bad, and they started losing money from that. But they, back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, those were the individuals that now are still smoking or having problems have with cancer or can't kick the smoking. So what they're doing here is they're grabbing your kids, our kids in our community, they're, they're making them addicted to nicotine by other means. So our kids in this time are gonna be the ones that 30, 40, 50, 60 years down the road are the ones that are gonna have the problems of whatever is to come with this. We don't know yet. So I try to pitch that to the kids when I'm in the class because it's so new, we don't know what the health problems are within, um, within this stuff yet. But I wanna make this interactive. So if there's any questions while we go through stuff here, uh, please don't be afraid to raise your hand. We're gonna be walking around to show you guys stuff. I'm gonna have to toss this mic back and forth to Officer Cushman when he wants to say stuff. But I'm gonna start off with the stuff that we usually see on school grounds, if you wanna walk these around. So what the terms that the kids are using is drooling. You can pass around what we did in the back. <laughs> We do have a count, and if we don't find it, we'll be searching everybody. <laughs> yeah. So um, basically, the kids call it Juuling, uh, which is a brand. Juul is a brand of uh, e-cigarette. All right. So basically, they have these small devices that you can tell they're pretty small. They're like pen size. They can hide them in their pockets, hide them in their hands. Um, I got one here. I'll kind of show you what I'm talking about. So it's this small, right? So they'll just grab them, put them in their hands, and walk around like this, all right? And you have no clue that they have this in their hand. Or drop them in their pocket. You can't tell because it's so small it's in their pocket, all right? Drop them in their backpacks, whatever it may be. A lot of kids are hiding them in their socks. When we find them in the bathrooms and we suspect something's going on, we'll find them in the kids' socks. So they're getting smart on how they're, they're hiding these things. When they first started coming out, you would see these things being charged on charging devices. I might have one right here, if you want to grab it out of that bag. They're USB charging devices, so they'll plug this into a USB charging device, and every student at Simsbury High School has a Chromebook, right? Those little laptops, they'll plug them into their laptop, and it'll look like a USB, like, memory that they're putting the memory stick, right, thank you. All right, so when a teacher first walked around and had no clue what these were, the teacher believed the student that they're just putting stuff onto their memory stick. Now that we've educated the teachers on the current issues, uh, we've been having a lot more complaints from teachers that have been seeing these things being charged on their laptops. All right, and same thing, I'm getting phone calls from parents that had no clue what these things were and they're seeing it on their kids' computers and they're like, oh, Johnny, what's that? And they tell them, oh, it's a memory stick and they believe them, but. We'll pass those around so you guys can see them. So along with these small pods, or the small jewels, are the pods, which are these little things that are plugged into the top of the device. Within this is where the, the juice will be. Um, for the most part, the ones that, or all the ones that we're passing around are regular nicotine delivery devices. Um, and they buy those pods at the local gas stations, all right? Now, I'm gonna tell you guys this right now. Most of these kids that are using this stuff have a connection with somebody that's 18 or older that can go purchase this stuff. I work, well, Todd, Officer Cushman and I are working with DEMAS, Department of Mental Health and Services, and what we do is we do um, some random checks of the gas stations using 16 and 17 year old kids that work for the state of Connecticut to go into the gas stations um, and make sure that they're in compliance of selling to only over the age of 18 and they have to ask for an ID. Uh, in the past year, we've only had, I think, two, maybe one or two that have failed, um, but every three months we do these checks to make sure that they're in compliance. So. Along with those devices, there's going to be bigger devices that come if you want to open that up. So K 
kids are getting like as we talked about earlier kids are getting smart about where they're buying the stuff as well you can go online to purchase these things oh thank you for the return one two <laughs> we only got two who's got the third he gave one, she gave one you back. One out. So there's bigger devices called mods, and Officer Cushman doesn't know how to put it together, so I'll do it for him. Uh, he's got it. <laughs> that proves that we don't like this stuff and we don't use it, so. Um, these are bigger mods that are being used by the students. The smoke that comes out of these small ones is very minimal to none, and the kids are hiding it under their shirts in classes or they're just doing it out in the open if the teacher's not looking. With these bigger mods, you'll get a bigger cloud of smoke, um, like a cloud of smoke that you can't even look through. Uh, the odor on both of them is about the same, except the odor on the smaller things isn't gonna be as strong and it won't last in the area as long. That one will. And depending on what the, the, the individual is using to smoke is, is what, uh, try not to push the button. <laughs> You guys can probably smell it as you pass it around. It's a very, that's like a very fruity flavor. Um, when you smoke it, what's that? Not gonna pass our taser around either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We were gonna let you guys pass the taser around, but now I'm afraid to do that. So it's gonna be a fruity flavor or whatever, whatever flavor they wish to smoke. Um, that's the smell you're gonna get. A lot of the times you'll, I'll walk into a bathroom and it smells like uh, a girl was just using perfume in the men's bathroom. And now I know why. So to fill the tank that's on those devices, those bigger modifications, um, they're buying these bigger bottles of juice. And they're using these to fill up their, their mods. And they come in all different sizes. I got three different sizes here. I'll pass these around as well. Um, and you guys will see the names on these things. It, it's, uh, it's obvious that it's meant for kids, all right, based on what they're calling the juices. Because I don't think a adult is gonna be walking around smoking high clouds, right? Or, I don't even know what this, Mr. Salty. So. If you want to pass those around, take a look at those. So what you, let me ask. Yeah, go ahead. These are like these flavors are. Let me give you that. You Thanks. Go. These flavors are, seem to be primarily geared towards the kids. What's being done um, to prevent these companies from targeting the kids, legislatively or otherwise? I don't know you if you or. Would you be able to answer that one? Um, well, it's taken a while at the federal level for re any regulation to catch up with the manufacturing because these have been on the market for many, many years. Um, electronic nicotine delivery systems, as I mentioned, were initially, um, you know, promoted as a way to help people with smoking cessation. Now it's transitioned. It wasn't until this year that the FDA will be allowed to require labeling. It won't be until the following year that manufacturers are required to articulate what is actually in the product. Um, and I think the next step is gonna have to be advertise limitations on advertising, et cetera. So it's still a work in progress, but you would think that we would have learned from the tobacco industry lessons learned and that we would have gotten on it much, much more quickly. You see, one of the things is since it's being considered a public health issue, why isn't there a bigger push, a more, you know, making it more of an urgent issue, especially with kids being involved? Um, well, I mean, we could talk a lot about the politics of changing a, or, or, you know, about public policy. Um, you know, I know the public health arena, we're pushing hard. We, even in Connecticut, to get a bill passed that would increase the age of tobacco purchase to 21 is highly politicized. Um, unfortunately, the tobacco industry has invests billions of dollars on lobbyists at the state levels and at the federal levels, and our governmental public health entities, we don't have those same resources. Um, so it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's driven by greed and money in large part. Okay. Yeah. So probably out of place, but 
November is election time. Politicians <laughs> will be coming around. Let's have them do their job. So just a go ahead. It, for just the flavoring yeah, it, itself or the actual device? No, the, the flavors, the the the, the, the it's pretty mm. inexpensive. Yeah, it ranges from $10 to uh, $30, $40, $50, <laughs> depending on how much nicotine you want in it. Bigger, the bigger the bottle, obviously, the more expensive. Yeah. Uh, another tax. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So just to piggyback on what she's saying as far as the laws and how we're going to catch up and all. What we have to understand is we're always going to be behind as these things come out. So right now it's this. We're going to be behind as far as the laws catching up to prevent it like we were with cigarettes. So really what we should be doing is what you guys are here now, learning about it, you knowing, notifying your neighbors you saw, somebody else doing it, those of us that are in the schools notifying parents that it's going on uh, but we also need the cooperation from home when we contact home when the school contacts home to have the acknowledgement and have cooperation from the house to say yeah this is an issue we'll help you with it let's let's do something what can we do with our kids um, we could do that a lot faster than we can get the people down in the big buildings there to write a law to help it. So we don't really have to wait for True. the law to kick in. That'll help us. Uh, but what we need to do as adults is really monitor our kids better and figure out who do we notify, what do we do. Um, and that goes with, with everything. That's not easy. So we can't fall back on a law yet to do that. But that's something uh, I have two kids. I mean, that, that's what we need to do is to inform and kind of back up each other saying that this is obviously not the right thing to do it's going to hurt you in the end so how do we all as a team work together to to get that going uh, because that's going to last longer than because the kids don't care about what what was on that poster behind us what was on that it, they don't care they're not listening to that regardless of the age they're going to get a hold of it half the kids we see are not 18 21 but they're going to end up with it so you know even with putting a law in that'll help us but it won't be the end of, it'll be something else next time. Uh, so it's, it's more on the community right now to kind of work together to, to squash it. Could you use the microphone when you ask a question? So we Thanks. You're on the spot now. To address the topic that you were just talking about, and I was taking notes, mm -hmm. <laughs> how do you address non, the non-nicotine argument that you're going to get from your kids oh there's some that don't have nicotine out there and oh I'm not inhaling how do you address that with your kids as you saw with these devices you have to inhale otherwise it does nothing uh, so for example if this was charged up if you don't inhale then what are you doing with it nothing so there's your argument for I didn't inhale. That's the way this one is activated is by inhaling. There's no button to push or anything like that. So as soon as you inhale, it activates the device to start burning the, the vapor. But I think she yeah. wants to Well, even those that are not using it for the nicotine, there are chemicals in that liquid. Uh, the flavor isn't natural. I mean, look at, a, look at some fruit juices. There's nothing in there that resembles a fruit. It's a lot of chemicals. And so they're still being ex exposed to things that are bad for their health. Um, I believe, uh, you know, the science is still evolving, but I believe that the study that just came out that looked at the, on average, they were 16-year-olds, they looked at both nicotine and non-nicotine, and they identified at least five carcinogens in the urine of those kids. Yeah. So just to piggyback off of your question as far as the nicotine and not nicotine, and to talk about genders related to that, what I see the most in the high school age, I see a lot of the females using the uh, vaporizers with no nicotine. Um, and it's because they like the flavor. Um, they don't realize they're actually getting hooked on that at the same time as well. Um, and then a lot of the males 
uh, will use it for the nicotine, for the high, the quick buzz before they go to class, jump into a bathroom, and then get to class. I think she was next there. What are you doing in the high school? I hear from several parents every time their child goes into the bathroom, they can't help but run into people vaping. Good question. So uh, what I've been tasked to do is during the professional development days, I've been asked to come in and talk to the teachers about it because the teachers had no clue what this, what this was. So I've actually done three professional development days with them on this stuff, getting them uh, more aware of what to look for, what to smell, uh, different behaviors from the students. I've actually asked the teachers, instead of using the faculty bathrooms, to be more present in the, the general bathrooms uh, maybe to stop the kids from actually going in there and doing what they're doing um, and be a little bit more uh, reactive to, to these situations. Because uh, a lot of times the teachers would suspect a student of using it and we wouldn't find out for a few hours later. Um, and they've actually been a lot better if they suspect it being used in class or in the bathroom or before their class, they actually call an administrator or myself right away and we go up there and we talk to the student about it because it's that much of an issue. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, I wonder, like in elementary school, we put teachers in recess time. Are we heading towards some kind of monitoring system every time there's a break in classes because that's when they're going to yeah. have it? I mean, and, and one thing we definitely ask the teachers to do more as well is during passing time to be more present in the hallways. But more on a mandatory kind of thing. I mean, recess is mandatory for teachers to be on the playground. Yeah. I'm sure there are because there, when cigarette smoking was a problem in schools, they came out with the sensors that blink red outside the bathroom when smoke is detected within. Um, so I'm sure that technology is, is, is coming out. And we've actually had these discussions before during our administration meetings at the high school. So it is a thought. Um, obviously, this is very new. This is the first year we've had major problems with this stuff. So we're slowly trying to adapt and become better with trying to deal with this. And aside from dealing with the teachers and, and educating the teachers, I'm actually educating the students about this stuff as well, going into health classes um, and other classes as well. If a teacher believes there's an issue within her class with it, I'm not afraid to go to the class and have a discussion about it right then and there. I have two questions, uh, please. <clears throat> the first one is, can you give us some idea of the extent of vaping in terms of percentage of students vaping in the high school? That's question number one. Um, what is your estimate of the percentage of usage in the high school? And question number two, what are the penalties that uh, are in, in place uh, when a student is found to be vaping or violating vaping policy? So on the high school side, I can only speak to what I get as information from other students. Is when I do end up dealing with a student that is found with these items, I kind of ask them, what do you think is the number of students in our school, a percentage of students? And I get anything from a range of 60% to 75%. High number. Yeah. What about the penalties? Penalties, um, yeah, and then I'll jump in with you. Um, 16 and 17 year olds is a $50 fine and under 16, it's a juvenile summons, which if it's your first offense, you'll be referred to Juvenile Review Board, and I'll have you talk about Juvenile Review Board and what, what it is. Um, I'm Kristen Formanak. I'm the chairwoman of the Juvenile Review Board, and if a student is found to be vaping on school grounds or in possession of the electronic device, they'll be given a summons to report to the Juvenile Review Board, and then um, my team will hear your case and ask you questions, and then you're going to be given um, a punishment, much like if you were sent to the adult court system. Um, at a minimum, you're going to get 15 hours of community service that will be performed with our janitorial staff at the local schools. Um, um, you're also going to be assigned a written three-page essay on vaping, the contents of the juice, why it's bad for your health, and why it's illegal. Um, and I've actually gotten quite an education on reading those papers. Um, we've had a lot of cases of students vaporizing coming before our Juvenile Review Board, unfortunately. Um, and you'll also be um, required to attend an educational session, and you'll be asked to participate in family therapy. Um, so there is punishments in place if you are caught doing this on school grounds. It's being taken very seriously, um, and when you come before our Juvenile review board it's something that we take very seriously as well 
And as far as school punishment goes to school does uh, give their side of the punishment, whether it's a detention suspension, that's up to the school. I, I don't partake in that. So question for you. Um, you had mentioned about the nicotine uh, aspect of, of uh, using this uh, vaping. What about the THC and how is that infused into this uh, um, device and how is it detected? So I've <laughs> if, if, if you were waiting for at the end of Yeah, that, well, I was actually just going to jump into that, so it was perfect. Thank you for leading me into my next subject, which is the THC cartridges for the vaporizers. Um, I won't be passing these around because some of these still have THC oils in them. Um, but there's two different kinds that we're going to show here. But where students are getting these from, um, it's, yeah, I'll have Officer Christian walk with them. Um, most of the students that I find that have these are purchasing these through their drug dealers uh, because these are found through the medical field of marijuana, um, which will be purchased in, the, in through you know, your doctor that prescribes you your THC oils or your marijuana. Um, so most of these that you'll, be, you'll see, they'll have a, a metal tip mouthpiece. Um, most of the ones with the metal mouthpiece have the THC oils in the cartridges. Um, a lot of the times you'll see, we can find that students are, have a connection of just getting the oil itself and refilling cartridges if they know how to do that. I'm not gonna get into all the, the technical stuff. Um, and then this one that Officer Cushman has in his hand um, is actually a marijuana burner itself that attaches to the vaporizer. So you can actually burn the marijuana right in this cartridge instead of buying a pipe or a bong or whatever else they wanna use. Does, all right, so your question was, does it have a marijuana smell? Um, it'll smell, but it'll be quick. It'll be a very quick, faint smell for maybe five seconds, and then it'll disappear. So it's very easy to hide, and if they're mixing it with their vape juice to you know, hide the smell even more, you're probably not gonna get the smell at all. So it's a lot easier to hide that stuff. And we've only had uh, mm, two cases on school grounds with, with that, which, And that's 50 hours of community service. <laughs> is that the same as if they were found with marijuana, regular marijuana? Uh, marijuana starts at 50 hours. Okay, so marijuana starts at 50 hours of community service. If you're under the age of 18. Juvenile Review Board's only for juveniles. <laughs> Any other questions? No. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I'll come back with the mic. Thank you, thank you. Um, my question is, you went over about if they get caught with the um, vape at school, what happens if they're just walking uptown and you see them? Is it the same consequences? Uh, yeah, it's, it is the same consequences um, because legally, if you're in public with the, the vaporizer itself, it's still illegal. Obviously, if you're in public, you're not going to have the school consequence side of it. For 16 and 17 year olds, yep. Under the age of 16, it's a juvenile summons, which then we refer them to juvenile review board if they don't have prior offenses. That's the key thing that I try to tell these, these kids that we're dealing with is you just wasted your first get out of jail free card, basically, on something this small. Right. You know? Um, and they won't be able to have the chance to go through juvenile review board again if it's something more serious. Nope, if, it, if they're 16, 17 years old, they'll get an actual infraction ticket like you would if you were caught speeding. Right. Yep, same thing. Okay. Any other questions or concerns or comments? On average, how many under 16 children are you seeing at the juvenile board on a weekly basis? <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I could certainly give you 
spot on statistics. Juvenile Review Board meets once a month and we have had four to five cases every month with um, vaporizing cases. Uh, most of them are in the high school. We've only had two that were from the middle school. Uh, so thankfully it's not as prevalent there yet, um, mostly in the high school, but it is hitting our younger kids. Just to go off that too, I was working out at the gym a few days ago and when I was on the when I was out at the gym, I look over and there's two kids. I'm not going to tell you what gym it was at, but one kid had a vaporizer in his hand and he was working out while he was smoking a jewel. And to myself, I looked at my partner and I was like, is this seriously happening right now? Like, how does that even make sense? How does that mix? How do those two worlds even mix? You know, it just didn't, it blew my mind. I just want to throw that out there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, Chris, you have anything to add? I think one of the more frustrating things for us is we've already gone over. When it was cigarettes, it was pretty easy. When the, somebody's just smoking a joint or smoking a bowl, pretty easy. These are very hard to detect. Um, so going back to what can we do in the high school and all this stuff, I mean, it's if you don't walk in while they've smoked it, you could be in the stall next to them and have no idea the sound, the smell. So even if, you know, if we said to kids, hey, let us know what's happening, they could very easily go in there, come back out, and have no clue something happened. But like, like you said, it's very likely that a kid's going to go in, see it, and walk out. If they don't say something, which you know, we, we know at that age, I'm not going to rat on this person, I'm not going to tell about that. Um, but again, that information comes back. Um, so we often get, hey, I think so-and-so is doing this or so-and-so is doing that. Um, but it's not that easy <laughs> to, to prove. Um, so it, with us being in the schools, we do get a lot of kids that will tell us some things. Uh, but it's not necessarily that they just tell us and we go grab the kid, pull him out, and say, hey, so-and-so said you were doing this. It doesn't, it, we wish it was that easy, but that's just not the case. I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a bathroom and there's five guys hanging out in the bathroom. I don't know about you guys that are in here, but I usually don't hang out with my friends in the bathroom. <laughs> but there's five guys in the bathroom. I walk in and they all spread out like ants, like, oh, everyone grab a stall. You know, so we obviously know what's happening in, sorry, the microphone. We obviously know what's happening in the bathrooms and we try our best to stay on top of it, but it's very hard to prove at the same time. Um, and I, I think having adults in a bathroom is going to be a little creepy. Uh, so even if we suggested it, I think there'd be a lot of pushback on. Uh, you know, but, but it, I'm, I'm telling you, even if you're outside that door and they walk in, they could there could be a group of five, six people. They could all smoke four or five of these and walk out, walk by you, and you, you wouldn't have any idea. And then as far as work. We would have no right to just search them. Yeah, we've had students do it right in front of teachers, just stand there doing it right in front of the teacher. You know, they, it's like no care in the world, yeah. you know. Um, so, I, I, again, harping on, I, I think, parents communicating with us and kind of listening to our concerns when we see it um, and then taking it to heart is going to help um, because if we wait for the big wigs downtown to write something, it's too late by then. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to be behind most times on whatever the new fad is. In this case, it already started happening, and now we're trying to play catch up. When this phase is out and it's the next thing, we're going to play catch up. Uh, so the most we could do is inform people so they know what to look for. They know what to, if they see any of these things at your house, um, you know, at the schools, we've tried to show them what we're looking for so they know what it is like for example this is custodians just on their normal thing picking them up sticking them to a paper and saying this is what we found so it, there's no more better proof than it's happening um so and it's just like cigarette butts back in the day right when they were finding cigarette butts this is what the remnants is of big rises right Well, so 
If you go into any gas station, you'll, well, you'll see a stack of pipes, clear glass pipes. I haven't seen anybody buy those to put regular tobacco in. So that pipe is perfectly legal for any one of us in this room to have in their possession until you put the illegal substance in it. So a vape shop, again, if you're of age, right, and now it's the new craze, somebody's going to take advantage and make money. So now it's up to those individuals at those shops to do the right thing when kids walk in and say, we're going to card you. And secondly, if we card you and it looks funny or we don't think you're of age, we're not going to sell it to you. So it's basically reliant on the people working there, which is why we do these spot visits to see, on average, who, who's doing the right thing. Now, in saying that, we could show up at 1 o'clock and do it, and the new person comes in at 4 o'clock, and we don't hit that person that particular day, and they sell it to four kids. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, it's very frustrating. So, uh, we get everything you're saying. We wish it was easier to just throw a blanket and say, here's exactly what we're going to do, and we're done with it. But that, that's never going to be the case, unfortunately. Okay, well, that being the case, um, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I hope we've provided some useful information for you. And if you would join me in thanking our panel participants tonight. <laughs>Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.